mentioned uh, mentioned this last week, and I wanted to uh, wanted to mention it again. We're uh, we're doing baptisms uh, on February twelfth, and, uh, and so if if you have made a decision to to trust Jesus, if you know that uh, you've fallen short, but but you're a uh, you're a person who has said Jesus, uh, come into my life, come into my heart, um, transform my life. I want to follow you. I want a relationship with God. We would love to celebrate that with you. We would love to to see you publicly tell your story and, and celebrate that. And so there's a there's a QR code up there. If you want to be baptized, uh, you can you can grab a quick picture of that. Uh, it'll take you to the sign up. We would love to talk to you more about that. Sometimes people are like, I feel like I should get baptized. I I know that I'm supposed to do that. I want to do that, but it intimidates me. Or I don't know all that that means. Uh, we would love to get together with you if that's if that's over Facetime. If you're busy, if you're out of town, if that's coming to the office and and talking with our staff, we would love to see you take that step of obedience. And publicly identify with Jesus and, and, and also publicly encourage your friends and family, people you can invite, publicly encourage our church. And so I want to invite you to, uh, to do that and to celebrate that. And, and we're, we're excited. We're looking forward to that. So please, please consider that. Consider if that isn't a step that you've taken. We would, we would love to see you take that step of obedience and encourage us as a church. All right. Well, uh, I was I was sitting down there in the the front row, and uh, sometimes Krista over here is singing, and and then Jeremy would pop in on harmony. If you guys don't know, they're married, and uh, uh, I just wanted to tell us as a church: if you've ever heard them sing together, and then thought, "Why isn't my marriage that good? Why why can't we harmonize like that?" I too have had that thought. That's nothing against my marriage. My wife's not in here. I hope she doesn't listen to the podcast. But uh, some marriages have different gifts. I just want you to know that. All right. So if you can't sing like two beautiful angels, it's not your problem. All right. It's 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 okay, and your marriage is okay. All right. Uh, no, I'm just just joking around. But uh, this is this is week three uh, in a series uh, that we started a, a couple of weeks ago. Obviously, week three uh, in a series called "Listen and Move: Living in the Holy Spirit." And the single command that Jesus gave his followers, gave his disciples. Uh, before igniting a movement was this. He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. And he was telling his followers to wait for the Holy Spirit. We know that God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit and that we can walk with him and we can, we can operate in obedience. And uh, we're doing this series because uh, sometimes in the modern evangelical landscape, we see uh, churches that, if we're being honest, in some way we kind of feel like they, they overemphasize the Holy Spirit. And, and there are other uh, groups that, that underemphasize the Holy Spirit. And, and we want to, to find the sweet spot where we can say, Lord, uh, we, are, we are looking to you. We are looking and, and listening to the Holy Spirit. We want to grow in our knowledge and our theology. But we also want to not just listen, but we want to move. We want to grow in our obedience, and we want to grow in the, the way that we listen and, and also move to what God is doing. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we said that Jesus is our foundation, uh, but the Holy Spirit is our fuel. And last week, we, we went over some, some lists because there, there's some things we wanted to know as a church, uh, what we can know of the Holy Spirit. We said the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is eternal and holy. Followers of Jesus are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Followers of Jesus are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Followers of Jesus are filled with the Holy Spirit. And followers of Jesus are, are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And we've been talking about not just the, the knowledge of that, but what that means and what we can experience. And so here was the list we went over, what we can experience of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has emotions. The Holy Spirit has his own will. The Holy Spirit helps us speak in difficult situations. The Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit gives us power to be God's witnesses. The Holy Spirit gives us power to put sin to death. The Holy Spirit gives us power to abound in hope. And being led by the Holy Spirit produces fruit. And we also said the Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts. And we'll be talking about that more uh, in detail next week. But this concept that we kind of outlined uh, was that we want to be in step with the Holy Spirit. We want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And how we can achieve that is to simply trust in the ways that God has revealed the Holy Spirit to us, the ways that he says that we can experience the Holy Spirit. As we trust that and rest in that, we can listen and move and experience the Holy Spirit. And so we're excited to, uh, to be together again today. I want to take us to a, a passage of scripture in, in John chapter 11. And so if you've got a Bible, you can uh, open up your Bible there. We're going to be in verses 1 through 13. If you've got a, a Bible there that's under your seat that you're opening up, uh, it's on page 624. Uh, there's probably a Bible around you there. And if you don't have a copy of the Bible that you like like that one, feel free to walk out of here with it. And if someone says, hey, you're stealing that, just say the redheaded guy said I could. All right. So uh, that's our that's our gift to you. But we're going to be in John 11 verses 1 through 13. 
And uh, looking, looking at an example of, of where uh, Jesus gives us a glimpse of, of prayer and, and praying for the Holy Spirit. It says this in John chapter 11, verse 1, page 624. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Now, obviously, uh, it kind of sets it up there in the passage here. It says the disciples are asking Jesus to teach them how to pray. And so in response, he kind of outlines uh, this prayer, which you and I probably know uh, because it's, it's popular. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And so we see that this occurrence here in, in John. We also see maybe the more famous one in Luke. But what's unique about this prayer is the way that Jesus begins this prayer because he, he says, Abba, or or dear father, and the Jews had several names for God, but they also had several ways that they would not say the name of God because they wanted to keep the name of God holy, and they would avoid saying his holy name. And so no one up to this point had ever probably presumed to call God daddy or or father. I mean, that would have been a little a little weird. It would have kind of been off limits. And Jesus is inviting his friends and his followers to share in this intimate knowledge and relationship that, that he has with God. Prayer gives us an intimacy with God. Prayer is our, our intimate doorway or, or gateway that we can see and experience our relationship with God. It's not the only way, but it's one of those ways. And certainly prayer gives us an incredible intimacy with God. And it's not like any other prayer that's been uttered before. This prayer is unique. This is, this is love talk. This is love speak. Jesus is showing us what intimacy looks like. And so the disciples are to pray that God's name be kept holy and honored and that his kingdom will be established on earth. They're supposed to ask God to provide for their needs day by day and that he'll forgive their sins and not put them through hard testing. And it's a very short and, and simple basic and yet foundational prayer. This prayer honors God for his love and holiness and, and purpose. And so I think that we can, we can take from that the fact that the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he prayed this. And so our prayer should honor God's love and holiness and purpose. Our prayers should echo that. And we see that in this example. This prayer asks that everyday physical, spiritual, and moral needs are going to be met. That our immediate needs, that our, our need for food, our need for forgiveness, our, our need for protection... We can take those things to God and Jesus encourages his followers to pray in this way. He goes on in verse five, it it says this, then teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. Just so you have some context. This, uh, this, this story probably doesn't fit uh, how this would go down in, in Hilliard or West Columbus because we're all like, oh, I've got a finished basement. I've got three bonus rooms. My friend will text me when he's coming. It's probably, probably not how this, this story went down. Uh, we, we, we can't really put ourselves in this, this time period, but, but back then uh, people would, would sleep in, in basically what was a, a one-room house. And they would often use uh, basically what's a, a large shared sleeping mat. And so if someone showed up at your house and you're all sleeping in one room, that would probably wake you up. And if you were to stand up off the shared sleeping mat, if someone gets out of bed that you're sleeping in a bed with, obviously that wakes you up. And we think of this traveling and we're like, that'd be a little weird. But if someone were to show up at your house at the end of the day at midnight, that'd be a little crazy too. Now, obviously, we, we often travel during the day. We leave early in the morning. We make flights and we go places. Uh, people in this context might have traveled uh, more as the sun was going down because it was a cooler part of the day. But to show up at someone's house where they're all in one room, <clears throat> to, to knock on the door, 
That would probably wake everyone in the house up. If that didn't, probably sliding the giant deadbolt that they would have used to hold the doors shut in those days would have woken everyone up. And if you were able to, to do those things, if you were able to, to wake up and, and get off the mat and slide the deadbolt open and welcome your friend, the first thing you'd probably say is, hey, it's a little late to be showing up. This story is kind of setting up the fact that it's, it's a little awkward to, to ask to be hosted in this way. And yet, that's the context were given. Maybe it was a little inconsiderate. Maybe it was annoying. Maybe this person was just doing the, the best they could, but we're told that we should have persistence like this person. Now, most people read this story and see the word persistent and think that this story is saying, well, if I persist long enough, I, I guess God's just going to automatically do whatever I say or whatever I ask. And Yet the larger context of this story, kind of verses in 10 and and 13, the rest of scripture teaches that God's eagerness to hear our prayers, God's eagerness to grant our requests and the meaning that we should take from the word persistence there is not what we're thinking. See, the the word there in the original language kind of means avoidance of of shame. And while it didn't come to have this, this meaning of persistence as we know it, the concept of shame was linked to it. And so the parable would more likely translate in our language and our customs and, and our culture as this. Just as the man in bed would respond so as not to incur shame, just as he would not want his, his, his village or the other houses or the other people around to be like, oh, this guy's a terrible host. Oh, he's unloving. Oh, he doesn't love his family. He doesn't take care of his friends. Just as this guy would respond, God will always do what is honorable and consistent with his character. In the echo of this teaching on prayer, Jesus gives several pictures of of God, our Father's goodwill. And Jesus points out that God is better. God's a better host. God's a better listener. God's better at hearing us than any neighbor or person, even if we can put them in an inconvenient place and say, oh, I guess they have to respond now. If a neighbor will eventually and reluctantly answer a call for help, won't God most willingly hear our prayer? Here's what we can take from this. God will hear our prayers and do what is honorable and consistent with his character. See, the the persistence that it speaks of there is this continuation over a long period of time. We're called to practice this persistent, continuous dedication of talking to God and seeking intimacy through prayer so that our, our posture is not about getting what we want or manipulating the character of God, or thinking that that we're in control, but so that we can soak in his honor, so that we can soak in the consistency of his character and let that change us and change our requests and show us his will for our lives. This this story goes on. It says this, verse 9, And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. To everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. We said this in in week one as we've talked about this concept of of walking with the Holy Spirit, living with the Holy Spirit in intimacy with God. We, We said that all throughout his ministry, Jesus said that we should pray for him and bring our requests to him. And sometimes we think that that Jesus is just kind of like our own personal genie and we're manipulating him. But when Jesus says that we can ask for anything, we have to remember that our asking must be in his name. And the things that we're asking for in his name should be according to his character and his will. God doesn't grant requests that are contrary to the nature of his will. And we can't use his name as a magic genie for just our our selfish desires. But what we can do is trust this. If we're sincerely following God and seeking to do his will, then our requests will be in line with what he wants and he will accomplish them. And so Jesus is talking to his followers. Jesus is modeling intimacy for his followers. Jesus is saying that we should seek the Father and continue to seek the Father and continue to seek the Father, not because we want the Father to do what we want, 
but because as we seek the Father, as we rest in the Father, as we share intimacy with the Father, He will change us and He will change our requests and our hearts and our minds and our lives and our requests and our speech and everything we're putting forward will be in line with His character and His will. And that is the reward. Verse 11 says this, You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for him? Now we start talking about context and not understanding this visiting guest metaphor. We're definitely getting lost here in these gifts of the father, right? I know Christmas just happened and and I don't know if your kids asked for a fish and you gave them a snake. If so, you're a super weird family, right? If, if, I think if you give your kid a scorpion, you can actually be arrested based on Ohio law or something. But, but the, the point stands in, in this story. Kids ask for things. And as providers, as authority figures, as those who love them, we love to provide for our kids. My kids have asked for 3D printers, Hot Wheels cars, mini bikes, Barbie dolls. Some of their requests are ridiculous. We had a, a Christmas where my kids found out that Gucci was a brand and everything they wanted had the word Gucci in front of it. And we had to shut that down pretty quick. But for the most part, if my kids ask for something, we, we do our best to get those things for our kids, right? Now, I'm not, I'm not special. I'm a pretty average dad, but I think that goes pretty par for the course. Most parents as they see the desires of their kids, as they hear the desires of their kids, they try to meet the desires of their kids if those desires are are decent and and in line. Almost one year from today, my oldest Malachi is is gonna start driving. And so that's already on my mind. What kind of car am I gonna provide for him? And he'll see something and say, dad, will you buy me a car like that? And I'm like, I might, I'm gonna do my best. And I'm talking to my friends who their kids are already driving and I'm finding out how much insurance is and having anxiety about that. But the, the point is this, that most parents, most adults, we try to do our best to provide for our kids. We make it happen. We don't know how we make it happen. Maybe we stop buying ourselves things or maybe we change up the budget, but we make it happen. And that's what this story is alluding to. God is a better father than human parents. And if human parents are making it happen, God is going to meet our needs as they align with his will. If human parents with all their faults don't trick their kids or provide them something that they didn't ask for, won't God give good gifts to his children? Jesus is telling his friends here that they can surely trust God and ask him for things. They should knock and and long for access to him. They won't get everything they humanly want, but their needs are going to be met. And God's going to give them gifts that are always good. See, in this passage, Jesus encourages his disciples to pray, to talk to him, to, to seek intimacy and to ask for the things that are in their heart that they want. He's not saying to do that with our eyes fixed on things that distract us and things that are the object of our requests. He's saying, as you ask, have your eyes on God the Father and experience his goodness and know his goodness and watch his goodness pour over you and experience his will. That's the point of bringing our requests to him and, and God is, is wise and God will, will give what is wanted and needed as our eyes are on him. But at the end of this, there's another thing that's sprinkled on that followers of Jesus should ask him, especially for the Holy Spirit. That last verse, the last part said, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So I want us to know today that we can and should pray for the Holy Spirit. As we're seeking intimacy with God, as we're walking with him, as we're living with him, as we're experiencing him and knowing him and putting our eyes on him and trusting his will, we can and should ask and pray for the Holy Spirit. Because prayer inevitably expresses our theology. And so the things that we're asking for explain and tell our beliefs in God. And the things that we're asking for and trusting for and looking for explain what we know and believe of our Heavenly Father. And so Jesus asks us to pray in these themes of worship and and reliance and trust and celebrating God's redemption and 
He says, you can have confidence as, as you confide in me and you can exercise dependence on me and you can be persistence, persistent as you, as you seek my will. But he's letting us know this, that we should pray in line with God's character and will, asking for the Holy Spirit. We should pray in line with God's character and will, asking for the Holy Spirit. I think the, the context of, of Scripture matters. That's why we're talking about families sleeping in a one-room house and having a shared sleeping mat. That's why we're talking about kids asking for a fish or what would maybe be a, a snack back then. And the context of this story matters too. Scripture wasn't just thrown together. Someone didn't just say, oh, I got all these paragraphs. Let's uh, get them in a book here and and make them happen. No, as God gave us Scripture, these stories line up and are back to back to back because it it means something in the context. And so the, the part of Scripture that happens before what you're looking at and after what you're looking at all flows together and shapes it and And I love the context of this passage we just looked at. We looked at John chapter 11, but John chapter 10 has some incredible context. It's a story of two sisters, Mary and Martha, and these sisters are kind of different. And so when Jesus comes to visit, they respond in different ways as they're hosting Jesus in their home. See, Martha's really busy and hardworking and playing super host and getting everything ready. And, and Mary's just quietly sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him and, and learning. And that would have been an unusual sight in, in those days because only men were educated and would listen to rabbis. Women in, in that day were, were supposed to be getting things ready and, and doing more what Martha was doing in her busyness. And, and Luke lets this story unfold in chapter 10. You can go back and, and read it this week if you want. But Martha gets more and more flustered with the, the cooking and all these things. And Mary's just hanging out with Jesus. And eventually Martha explodes and Jesus refuses to to take her side. See, Mary may look lazy, but the fact that she's doing something that's more important is what's pointed out in this story. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's taking in God's truth. And she's not preparing food, but she's, she's taking in the only food that matters, the only thing that's going to feed her, and that's time at the feet of her Savior, listening to him and looking to him. And that's the context that, that sets up this story on prayer. That's the context that sets up what we just looked at. So I think this context would tell us that we're supposed to create margin. We're supposed to create stillness. We're supposed to be able to listen to what Jesus wants to tell us, what the Holy Spirit wants to tell us. And we're supposed to ask for the Holy Spirit to impart those things to us because those things matter. Jesus wants us to listen. He wants to illuminate things. He wants to teach us things. We're called to to slow down. And we've already experienced pieces of that this morning as we we sang. We closed our eyes and we raised our hands and we took deep breaths and we said, God, what are you trying to show us? How can I experience intimacy with you? And Jesus seems to model the same thing that at times we'll be obsessed with tasks. At times we'll be too busy. At times we'll be out of control and focusing on the wrong things. And we need to just focus on him and what he's trying to tell us. And he tells us as we're doing that, that we should ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we've already been given the Holy Spirit, but we need to ask God to to reveal his desires through the Holy Spirit. We need to ask God to to show us what the Holy Spirit is telling us so that we can experience this gift. We name this this series Listen and Move because we we want to learn. We want to learn. We want to be still. We want to listen. And part of being still and listening is slowing down. And part of slowing down might be this temptation that things aren't moving fast enough or that we're, we're suddenly bored. Or that things are too silent or we need some activity or we need a, a conversation. We've been promised that we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit when we surrender our lives to Jesus, when we make him our foundation. If we're surrendered to the Holy Spirit, we're told that that he will be speaking to us and illuminating things in our life and and teaching and, and bringing things to our minds. And so as we slow down, 
as we listen, I believe scripture promises that that's the case. And we've said this every week in this series that there's one Holy Spirit and, and yet many different people. And so we can trust that we have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit will say different things to us because we have different gifts, different platforms, different families, different functions, different lives, and and we're at different places. The Holy Spirit may tell you to speak and share your faith with someone. The Holy Spirit may tell you to to bless your next door neighbors with a meal. The Holy Spirit may tell you to give $500 to someone. The Holy Spirit might tell you that you're being called to plant a church and be part of the launch team. The Holy Spirit might tell you that you're being called to be the church planner and pastor of that launch team. I, I don't know what the Holy Spirit will tell us. But the first part of listen and move is, is listen. And so the, the last couple of weeks, we've tried to be silent. We've had music play and we've sat in silence and just prayed that the Holy Spirit would reveal what he wanted to do. And, and my hope is that that will happen again today. But we're going we're gonna to do something that, that may feel a, a little different because I think that God wants us to wrap our minds around exactly what it looks like to serve him and and live for him and how the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are kind of speaking and connected and working together in our minds and our lives and our hearts. And so we, we want to do this today. In the 200s, a Christian writer named Hippolytus is, is attributed with writing a, a prayer for the early believers that had them welcoming the Holy Spirit to move with these words. He he said this, and we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit. A prayer that basically echoes the end of that passage we looked at today. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit. And in the 800s, a Benedictine monk wrote a song basically to equip the church that, that echoed that message where people would say, come Holy Spirit, creator, come. And in the 1200s, this prayer, come Holy Spirit, written as a Latin worship poem called Veni Sancti Spiritus, took on a central place in the worship of the Western church. And so from the earliest days to the, the middle days to now, this phrase has echoed through the church where the church has, has been looking to God and saying, come Holy Spirit. Maybe you've experienced that song. Maybe you've sang that, come Holy Spirit, come. It's a cry of persistence. It's a cry of devotion. At times it can be a cry of desperation. It's a cry that's trusting the promises of God. It's a a cry that's looking forward to the promises of God, but simply just saying, come Holy Spirit, come. I want to hear you. I want to experience you. I want to know you and I want to act in obedience. And so for generation after generation after generation, the church has cried out, come Holy Spirit. And we want, to, we want to do that today. I know it's, it's probably not something that's, that's comfortable for suburban people. I know it's probably not something that, that maybe we've experienced in your, in your faith and in the, maybe the, the churches you've been a part of. And yet I think it's, it's pretty clear that we can see that asking God to experience and, and see more of his Holy Spirit is, is in line with Scripture. And so I want to I ask us to, to do something today. If, if you're comfortable with it, I want to ask you to, to just close your eyes. And, and even as, as Jeremy has already let us, just, just close your eyes and, and maybe hold your, your hands open and, and pray that. I'm going to ask you to, to pray it out loud. You don't have to scream it. You don't have to do anything you're uncomfortable with. But, but let's just model that and say that together. Let's say, come Holy Spirit. Say that where you're at. Come Holy Spirit. With your, with your eyes closed and just continuing in a, a moment of prayer, just repeat that a couple of times. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. It might feel weird. It might be unfamiliar. And yeah, I think that's okay because sometimes I think things that feel weird and unfamiliar are shocking our our previous experience or our normal function and that's okay the reason this can feel weird or be shocking is because let's be honest I'll, I'll speak for me most days and most moments 
I am not dependent and looking for the Holy Spirit. I am not asking the Holy Spirit to experience more of him. I'm just getting by and doing my thing and doing what I want and making some decisions. And so I want to ask us to just take a couple of moments and and be still before God. It's going to be awkward silence. There's going to be silence around the room, but the only thing I would love for us to hear is is each other saying, come Holy Spirit. Let's just take a, a minute and just pray that. Just ask over and over, come Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's reflective. Sometimes we're trying to figure out what God is telling us. And sometimes we're, we're acting because we have clarity and we know what God is calling us to. As we, as we sing, as we, as we reflect and worship more, you can stay seated where you're at. You can stand. You can, you can do whatever you need to do to hear from God. My heart is that you'll, you'll keep praying that prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And, and as, you, as you do that, We've been talking about this the last couple of weeks. And so this is not something that everyone has to do, or this is not something that, that we're, we're demanding, but we think it could be encouraging and a, and a step of obedience for some of us to share the things the Holy Spirit is telling us, a step of obedience for some of us to say, this is what God has shown me. And so we're, we're going to put a, a phone number up on the screen just that you can text and say, this is what the Holy Spirit is telling me. You can, you can text to, to that number and you can just say, this is what God is, is showing me. It's, it's anonymous. It's, it's not going to be, uh, we're not going to print that on a banner and put it on your house or anything. Don't worry. But sometimes I think just for us to say, I'm hearing from the Holy Spirit. This is what God is telling me. And this is what I want to commit to be obedient to can be a huge step. So let's continue in the spirit of worship. Let's continue in a, in a prayerful spirit saying, come Holy Spirit. And if you feel that God wants you to, to make that official commitment, to, to, to just say that and put that out there so that you know that you're acting in obedience and you can put a stamp on that and say, I'm listening. God, I'm walking in obedience. Feel free to text that number. Let me pray as we continue to, to worship. God, we just thank you so much that when we were lost, when we were separated from you, when we were far from you, walking toward death and trapped in our sin, you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to give his life for us. And Lord, as we understand the beauty that, that he has surrendered his life to us, we can surrender our lives to him and, and walk with you and know you. And God, we, we are, blessed by that. We are grateful for that. And Lord, we want to embrace the mission of the gospel. And to do that, we need to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, and to listen and be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And so God, help us listen to your Holy Spirit today. Help us walk with the Holy Spirit today. God, as a a church, as individuals, we cry out, come Holy Spirit. We want to know you. We want to experience more of you. We want to rest in you and we want to be guided by you. Come Holy Spirit. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen.